Bible says the message of the cross. Guys, what is going on? This is Brian Sumner. Welcome to the Foolishness Podcast. Stoked you were tuning in. We had a couple of heavy episodes on marriage, on divorce. Jesus is teaching on Matthew 19, where the Pharisees came to him, did not even understand their own text, the law, going back to Deuteronomy 24, where they said, is it lawful? Is it lawful to give to that woman a certificate? Can I divorce her for this reason? So we got deep into that. And today we're kind of staying on the same topic of God's picture of marriage, manhood, all the rest. But we're definitely turning the corner as far as energy. I've invited my good friend on, Kyle, whose podcast I was on last week. So, Kyle, what's going on? You look so different. What happened this yeah. past week? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this off air. I, I do feel different a little bit because yeah. I kind of had a big time in, in my jujitsu life. I was granted my purple belt last <laughs> week. And so it's kind of one of those deals. Uh, one of my first, or really my first jujitsu coach, he was kind of telling me how proud he was of me and all that. But the way he was describing it is like, you know, white belt, you're basically, mm -hmm. you're just, you're just a white belt. Like you suck. Everything's terrible. Like you're bad at everything. <laughs> and then you become a blue belt and you become serviceable, right? Yeah. You're serviceably terrible at jujitsu, but you know a few things, but the way he described it is like, once you get to that purple belt level and at our school, we don't really have like lifetime achievement belts handed yeah, out. Yeah, like, Hey, you've yeah. been training here for like seven years. So I guess here's a purple belt. Like yeah. we kind of got to earn it. Yeah. If we go to other schools and go to open mats, we need to smash everybody, right? That That's kind of our style. And so, like, whenever those people all come together and decide that you become a purple belt, a purple belt is mm – -hmm. you, you've reached a certain – you've ascended to a certain level. I mean, you're you're technically halfway there, I guess, in the jiu-jitsu yeah, journey yeah. if black belt is your goal or whatever. But at that level, it, it's kind of the way Jocko Willink has said it before. It's like mm -hmm. you're not getting beat up by anybody in a street fight unless they also know jiu-jitsu, right? Or unless yeah. they get a lucky punch and it's just – you've you're a certified you know what kicker at that point and so mm -hmm. i can't say that i feel that way because i know my my <laughs> my problems and my issues with jiu-jitsu and i know the places where i struggle but it's an awesome thing to know how good my coaches and teammates are mm -hmm. and for them to come together and consider that that i've earned uh that level it, it's it's an awesome feeling i'm not gonna lie to you well just for grandma and the mom who's tuning in saying oh they must do that karate stuff like little johnny <laughs> No, you know, yeah. jiu-jitsu is this art that's way over 100 years. I mean, Carlos and Helio Gracie, it's kind of got its fourth or fifth wind across the U.S. and the world. And you're not punching people. You're not harming people. You and I could roll for three hours. And right. unless we did something wrong, we wouldn't get hit. And I'm just saying this, you know, for one, to break the ice because as jiu-jitsu heads, we love talking about it in MMA. Right. But for two, that means you're generally spending three to four to five to six years crafting this daily you go to the gym you warm up you do some technique but you normally roll at least 15 20 30 minutes and what that means to the christian saying what are you talking about brian i'm spending that much time with men that week and mm -hmm. close proximity we're talking before we're talking after it's a brotherhood god has used it tremendously in my life there's so many people that come to our church because of it but so what I should have done is just wore my blue belt even now and stood up for the YouTubers, <laughs> hey. even though I'm not even in a, in a gi, because I did joke when I got my blue belt and I'm laying in bed taking photos with it. But anyway, yes, we are both. I'm a purple belt as well. We are halfway there, you would say, towards black. So now we kind of know what we're doing. By the time we're brown, we're crafting it. And then by the time we're black, we've got to relearn everything to do it properly, every little grip. But anyway, for you, Kyle, you being on... Um, Huge podcast, huge following, so much cool stuff going on. But really, if I was to say this is what you're about, you founded the Undaunted Life Ministry in 2017. You have a podcast of the same name that was, what, 10 and 15, as it was the, the Apple podcast, Spotify, all the rest. And you're very focused on training and encouraging up men. But really, you're as known for knowing the Duck Dynasty crew, the Robertsons, who kind of brought you in, and your podcast is the first show that they've put on their network, right? Just summarize mm. some of that, like your ministry, your focus, your goal, and how God is using you with the podcast, and then we'll go crazy, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. I did want to make one one yeah. comment to something that you just said about jujitsu. When you're spending that amount of time with people, you know, if you're spending 30 minutes rolling, or maybe you have some training partners that you roll with often, I probably yeah. have five or six guys that I've rolled with collectively for hours and hours, right? Yeah. And the difference with jujitsu than maybe another physical hobby, you know, mm -hmm. be it, you know, 
jogging or yeah. pick up basketball or golf or something like that is you're learning <laughs> quite a bit about somebody when yeah. you're when you're going with them in a physical type altercation because to those that don't know jujitsu it's basically submission wrestling there's no strikes no one's getting knocked out like you know it's not it, the ramifications aren't you know you're yeah. not going to be brain dead if you get you know hit hit the wrong way so but you can go really 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 hard you find out who the quitters are mm -hmm. you find out who the wusses are you uh -oh. find out who the people are that just they can't overcome they can't become resilient resilience will probably play a part into our conversation mm. so that's the thing that i think is really really key you learn something about a guy after rolling with him you know for a six or seven minute round that you yeah. would never learn if you played you know 40 rounds of golf like you're just yeah, not going to yeah. really find those different things but in terms of undaunted life there's a whole lot to it but essentially the time i became a christian yeah. i was 14 years old so as you know 14 15 years old so I'm learning what it is to be a man while I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian because I didn't grow mm -hmm. up in a Christian family. You know, I was born in Oklahoma. So by dint of birth, I was a Christian, right? Yeah. You know, you believe in God because I was born on <laughs> Wrestler, Red, Hunter, Red Christian. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Drive a truck. Like you're, you're born with all those things, right? But I'm trying to figure that out. And while I'm trying to figure that out, I'm realizing that the manly men aren't mm -hmm. in church mm -hmm. and all the godly men are supposedly in church, right? Mm -hmm. So the manly men are out doing something else. Whereas all the godly men are in church with their press shirts, you know, tucked yeah. into their khakis and telling yeah. you they'll pray for your brother and that kind of stuff. And so that was my paradigm until really in my early twenties, which is like, you know, you're, you're a godly man or a manly man, but you can't mm. be both. And whenever I started to realize it, even in my own philosophy and theology, that that's not appropriate, that mm. that's not biblical by any stretch of the imagination. I was like, man, someone should really fix this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I found John Eldridge and Wild at Heart and I found, you know, Tinder Warrior and I found some other books like that and some other yeah. philosophies. And I kind of helped with some other ministries, but the ministries weren't really hitting the mark that I wanted to hit. Mm -hmm. They were, they were allowing men to be too weak or, or too passive or even too feminine in yeah. certain ways. And I don't think they were calling them out in the right way. And I don't mean that with John Eldridge because John Eldridge is a personal mentor of mine. And so, mm. you know, I think he's done a fantastic job, wrote the seminal book for men's ministry called wild at heart. Yeah. But I just thought that there was a guy that was rougher around the edges, you know, the jujitsu fighter, the mm -hmm. skateboarder, the construction worker, the military uh, veteran, that those guys walk into church and maybe don't feel accepted. And it, and it goes beyond mm -hmm. the fact that they're wearing a pair of dirty vans you know, or cargo shorts. You know, it, it goes yeah. beyond that. They walk in and they're like, these guys aren't what I want to be. They're not what I want to emulate. And so that's why I started on Daunted Life. Uh, it mm -hmm. really, really started in onus when the, the Version Bible app that most people know and most people are yeah. familiar with and have on their phone, that was created by a church that's like five minutes away from my house, yeah. a church that I attended for a very long time. And I was going through the devotionals one day. Sorry, this is a long answer to your question. No, but I know we got we, plenty of time. I think I was on your podcast for two hours. So Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> we, we got plenty of time for sure. But I was clicking through the devotionals, right? So they have devotionals and you can look at topical mm -hmm. devotionals like, oh, I'm depressed or oh, I'm addicted or whatever. And then there's women's devotionals and then there were men's devotionals. So I'm scrolling through the men's devotionals. I'm reading a few of them. I'm like, man, these things are terrible. Mm -hmm. I was like, these feel like women's devotionals repackaged for men. Mm -hmm. Like that's what they felt like. And so I, I talked to one of my pastor friends at the church and I said, I kind of said that and he's like, all right, tough guy. How about you go write one? I was like, you can just do that. You can just write a devotional. He's like, yeah, write it, submit it. If they like it, they'll put it on the app. And so long story short, <laughs> so I he did. can see you were a little bit triggered. Then he goes, okay, yeah. bro, yeah. go, go was, in the woods with your ax, shoot a yeah. couple squirrels and let's write it. <laughs> That's exactly what it did. So I wrote a 21 day devotional that kind of explained the philosophy mm -hmm. of undaunted life, which is, you know, t focusing on spiritual, mental and physical resilience. I did one week on each of those. Yeah. And then I kind of forgot about it. Like they accepted it, put it on the app and I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm like, you know, minorly famous in this one little part of my life. Mm -hmm. But then months go by and me and this pastor are sitting down for lunch. We're having pizza, you know, having a good time, getting caught up. And as we're leaving lunch, he goes, oh, hey, by the way, congrats on the devotional. And I was like, bro, that was put on the app like six months ago. Like, thanks for the congrats, but you're a little late to the party, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of ribbing him a little bit. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's the number two most read men's devotional in the history of the app. And that's wow. only behind, that's only behind the pastor of the church that created the, the app. Right. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay. Did he I buy just, you your pizza as well at that no, point? No, no. I think I bought that day, <laughs> but it was like, I was just thinking to myself like, oh crap, I should have like probably proofread it a little bit more, a little <laughs> bit more closely since all these people are reading it. But I could tell that there was something 
in in my philosophy mm -hmm. in in my presentation and in my forwardness mm -hmm. that really resonated with men in a different way because i don't really pull punches right and i didn't mm -hmm. get as aggressive on the devotional as i do on my podcast mm -hmm. but that led to the podcast because people were like when are you going to write another devotional and i was like i'd rather jump off a bridge i don't like writing that much mm -hmm. it's just something that i did because i felt like i had to mm -hmm. and so i would much rather put you know five bullet points on a sheet of paper and flow for 45 minutes and so i just started the podcast i said it was going to be short form and i broke that rule by like podcast three right <laughs> and then i've just kind of gone out from there i tackle topics that are in the news i tackle topics mm -hmm. that are really difficult to deal with for most people that pastors don't touch whether yeah. it's critical race theory or abortion or you know any other yeah. thing going on transgenderism um and then i started doing a lot of interviews and you know here we are 270 something episodes later you know uh however many years later mm -hmm. and it's just just keep moving keep shaking keep growing well, you are a husband, you are a father of two kids, you have a mm -hmm. couple of animals, we love jujitsu, and I'll tell you, just take over however we want to in a moment, but here's the thing I want to qualify for people. You're not saying, hey, if you're a guy who goes in a church and loves khakis and you're whatever, you're not a man. But what you're saying is, the guy who's maybe outside who comes in, he only ever sees that guy maybe at church or the potluck, right. he doesn't ever really engage him, so... Praise to that guy, yeah, who's in the church, but there's a whole community of men, whether you just named all the things they are, whether they're fighter guys or they're this or they're that, there's also a lot who've just been through some hell and yeah. they hate life, they hate their dad, they had a bad, you know, dished a, a painful hand and they go into church and they go, okay, there's that guy who serves in the church, maybe when right. I'm 65, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. You would just, you're not here to throw rocks, you're saying, okay, as a man, because here's the thing, church, that I'm speaking to, you've got to hear this. Male and female, we are made different. If you go to a woman's conference and it's all pink and pretty, you know, and the desserts, and I love desserts, don't get me wrong, and the rest, yeah. and, you know, beauty from ashes and the rest, that's great. But if you came home from a men's tree that I gave and you were like, man, Pastor Brian was preaching that I'm God's prince, your wife would be like, yeah, and did he talk about the iron sharpened an iron? Did he talk yeah. about you going to war? Talk about you, you know, defending me when the neighbor goes crazy? So there is, I know it's been done to death, the helmet, the swords, the shields, yep. all God's armor, but we have to let go of all of that and say, how did God create us? You and me want our marching orders. I come to the gym, you're a purple belt, teach me jujitsu. You should know what to tell me. If I'm right. going to go skate, I don't want to fall, break my arm. If I'm going to go to the mats, I don't want to get submitted. If you and I are going to build a house, you want to know the foundation. That's how men are. I'm not saying be a jock or a meha, but I'm qualifying if people so right. they realize Adam named the animals and was going to go and take dominion. Eve was going to make things pretty. And I get it. Women can do plenty of things that men right. do. But biblically, and you've heard me say this, I think even on your podcast, if a guy runs into a church with a gun... I expect all the men to run to him, and I want all the women to flee to the back, and I mean even my own sons. So, as an English guy that wasn't raised in the church, you've got this podcast, all this is happening, you write, I mean, praise God, that, that's amazing. I haven't gone through it all, but now I'm like, man, I got to go in there, catch up. Did you go in yeah. and tweak it? Did you go uh, in? No. Uh, so that's my thing is I just leave it. And so people, same thing with old podcasts. I don't go back and edit stuff that I've said, but the, the whole thing, Brian, is about, mm -hmm. it's about market segmentation. So you're exactly right. I'm not getting onto the guys that are your typical church guy using air quotes. Cause we need that listening. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like everybody has a role to play. Amen. And so the thing is, is like my ministry is not for women. Cause Even I'm pastoring. Women, you hear me pastoring right. a little bit right here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. You're having to qualify everything I'm, I say, cause I'm the crazy ginger just screaming in the microphone. <laughs> right. But, but like, that's the thing is like my ministry is not targeted at women, even though some women do consume it and enjoy it. My ministry is not targeted at typical church guys, even yeah, though yeah. some typical church guys will listen to it and feel challenged and make some changes in their life. But again, mm -hmm. that, that, that's the entire thing. Everybody has a role to play. I'm going after the guys that can really create revival. And mm -hmm. I don't mean to say that the, the, you know, the typical, you know, a church guy can't do that. Yeah. I'm saying when we've seen revivals, it's been these men that God has used in extreme ways that already had the wiring in them to mm -hmm. do what was required of them. Maybe they didn't see that in themselves. Moses didn't see him as the right guy for the job. Mm -hmm. Peter probably didn't see himself as the right guy for the job. Saul and mm -hmm. Paul probably didn't see himself as the right guy for the job, but yeah. they had the wiring from creation to do the things God required of them. And then that's what was able to kind of create these tremendous revivals we've seen. Mm -hmm. And you're not saying to go be a macho guy. It's about chopping down this, building that, no. getting away. But well, you're saying it. this hunger to, to care for the world, but to go to bat spiritually. Because obviously, 
I mean, I haven't read it, but, but I know your devotion isn't, hey, make sure you do this many push-ups and burn down this many yep. things and kill this many bears. It's a spiritual practice. You look at these old revivalists, these guys like Leonard Ravenhill and these people, there was a, there was a pursuing God in a way that was radical. It was about right. a holiness and a reckless abandonment for him. Okay. So then how has the response been? I mean, how many years ago was that? You said 2017? Yeah, that was 2017. And I mean, the response ultimately has been is because, and this is what happened. Some people will try to peg me. So I was on a debate show over in the UK called Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. And they usually bring on a theist and an atheist, and then they have some sort of debate. But mm -hmm. I was on with another theist because they were brought on two, they were going to bring on two separate feminists to debate me and both of them dipped out. They were like, no, nah, we don't want any part of that. And so like, <laughs> I was on there with a guy that was a little bit more complimentarian or a little bit more egalitarian where mm -hmm. I'm more complimentarian. Right. And the thing is, is everybody wants to like peg you be like, Oh, so you want us all to have four wheel drive trucks and fight and drink beer and spit tobacco and all that. And I said, I don't, and I always just disarm. It. I say, I don't care what you're into. Like, the typically masculine things, because the things I just listed aside from spitting tobacco, I like, you know, smoking cigars. Like I like those things. Yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. I like fighting and drinking whiskey and like doing all yeah. those things. Yeah. But let's say you're into making artisan bread and uh, classical music and, and dance and things like that. I don't care. Yeah. What I care about is whether or not you cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. Because mm -hmm. as you read through the scriptures, mm -hmm. those are three things that are required almost for a godly yeah. life. And the physical part is where people get tripped up a lot, Brian, yep. because, you know, you mentioned, oh, do you have to do X amount of pushups? I've had people say, oh, so you have to have a six pack or you're not a great Christian man. That, and I say, that's not the <laughs> point. And I love pointing to the first four chapters of the book of Nehemiah. So without mm -hmm. going into a full sermon about that book, obviously Nehemiah cut bare to King Artaxerxes, uh, but he feels lament mm -hmm. after he finds out that the walls of Jerusalem have fell at the walls of a city in, that he's never been to, mind you, he's never been to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Like it's just the land of his forefathers. And he goes before the King risks his life by basically asking for a sabbatical and then he, you know, makes his way over to mm. Jerusalem. But as soon as he gets there, he's surveying kind of what's going on. He's not really telling people why he's there yet. And then he tells people, you know, basically, here I am. I'm Nehemiah, and we're going to fix this. We're not going to let this destruction stand yeah. any longer. We're going to take care of it. And you know what he didn't say next, Brian? He didn't say, so at dawn, everybody come in your most comfortable pair of shoes and your most comfortable clothes, and we're going to start a 90-day training program, and we're mm -hmm. going to get in shape, and we're going to figure out, you know, uh, we're going we're gonna to do sets of carrying heavy things, mm -hmm. and then we're also going to train to fight a little bit because, you know, people might try to, like, stop our project and all that. No, no, no. What he essentially mm -hmm. said was, is work starts at dawn. Yeah, yeah. So the people that rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem were physically ready. Yeah. They didn't go train. They were ready. Right. Mm -hmm. So when God called them to do something, they said, yes, Lord. And they were able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so these men that have completely given up on their bodies since their last high school football practice, and now they're in their fifties. Mm -hmm. What if God calls them to some tribal area in Africa to, uh, to help with water or wells or build houses or something yeah. like that, but they can't walk two miles in the heat without dying. I'm sorry. God mm -hmm. can do miraculous things, but also there are realities that he created in the natural world. And if your heart explodes, unless he intercedes and does a miracle, you're dead homie. Mm -hmm. And it's because mm -hmm. you didn't take care of yourself. And so yeah. God gave us one body. He blessed us with one body and mm. Jesus died for our souls and died, gave up his body. Right. And so that's just kind of one of those things in terms of, I'm already kind of preemptively going after the people that are like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with the you know spiritual resilience and mental. I kind of get the idea, but you know, physical, why do I have to be in shape? That's typically something only people that aren't in shape say. So, well, you know, the pendulum does have to swing and I don't hear what you're saying and go, Oh, you're so far this way. I was with a guy yesterday when I was rolling in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. I'll normally wake up six or seven. I'll go to jujitsu. I'll do what I need to do. I'll come back and get whatever I need from my wife. She's at home. You know, she'll do homeschool with the kids mm -hmm. and then I'll start my day. But I was with a guy yesterday who was a pilot of an airline. He's probably six, one, six, two, two hundred 200 pounds. And he's in crazy shape right now. And I just said, you know, what are you training for a competition? He goes, no, I have my airline testing and you probably know this. And he said, they literally measure your neck. Yeah. Because they want to, and that that just to me, you know, here's my trap. Like if you were mentoring me, I'd say, here's my deal. Skating was about selling myself. Skating was about product and Brian and pushing things. And when I became a Christian, no, Lord, it's all you. So I kind of just gave up on, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love to skate and all the rest of it, but I wasn't going to go train six or seven hours a day. 
Then for me to go from like 185 to like 2, 230 easy, and yes, I'm meeting with people, and yes, I'm doing travel and whatever, but now when you hit 42 and you carry that, and I'm a big guy, my legs are massive from skating, I mean, my arms, if I pick weights up, I just explode. I'm probably 220 now, but I'll tell you at 40, what you're saying is ministering to me in the practical. If I had a heart attack, who's here to raise my kids for the next 30 years when I should be able to craft what God has sowed into me? So even him just saying that about his neck was like, oh, it makes sense. And it's just, it helps with the sin of gluttony. And then here's the other thing. If I go outside right now today and there's a woman in the bush getting attacked, I will die for my faith. If you come in this house and you're cutting people's heads off and it's that day, I'll die. But if I can't pull someone off it and it's a purple belt, probably pull two or three people off pretty quick or just get a hold of someone, not even hit them, and they know this guy could stop this. That's the point. So you're focused on, and I want people to hear it, you said physically, emotionally, spiritually. What really you're saying is we're going from the milk to the meat and spiritually knowing who we are in Christ, emotionally how we just handle life. I mean, you could write, I'm sure you have, sermons on each one of these things you know so yeah yeah, what does that put out to you though i know you're already probably thinking what's next yeah yeah so spiritually mentally physically so a big component of mental is the emotional health and the emotional resilience but a part of it is getting rid of the excuses because that Mm. is one of the the crazy things about modern man is we're so good at making them and so Mm -hmm. specifically on the physical (laughs) side i have heard guys tell me before kyle i would be in shape i'm just so busy with my family And so they're telling me they don't have time to work out because Mm. they have families. And then most guys would just say, oh, okay, we'll have a good rest of your day praying for you. (laughs) But but I'm the guy that's like, oh, so you don't want to work out now and spend time with your family, but you're deleting like 10 or 15 years off the end of your life because you're fat and out of shape and you're going to stay that way. And that's factual. That's literally what happens in America. I was like, assuming that you don't get some sort of crazy cancer at a young age or get attacked by like a pack of wolves. Like when we look at all things, all other things being equal, if you're not in shape, your morbidity goes through the roof. And Mm -hmm. in issues like, look at COVID. Who are the people that are dying of COVID? Yeah. It's not a whole lot of 25 year old athletes. It's not a whole lot of 42 year old athletes. Yeah. It's a lot of folks that have basically given up on themselves at a very early mm-hmm. age if they ever did. And so I, I think that's a very important thing yeah. is, but there has to be balance. And that's the thing yeah. that I feel like is very important because if I were to say spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, well, let, let me actually back up just yeah, a little yeah. bit. Because people might be wondering why resilience? That's not like a common, you know, vernacular for most people. Resilience. Why isn't he talking about strength? I understand strength. Mm. The thing with strength, Brian, is strength wanes over time, regardless. Yeah. It's going right? to atrophy eventually. Your body's going right. to age. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Shaw, who's probably the mo- one of the most famous power lifters in the history of the United States of America, guy that lifts out of Colorado. I think he's won the world's strongest man four times. Uh, he hasn't won it in a lot of years. He's he's done well in the competitions, but he hasn't been the world's strongest man. Mm. And whenever he's 60, I bet you he's not going to be deadlifting a thousand pounds. It just call me crazy, <laughs> but I don't think that's something that's going to stick with him. And also the day after Brian Shaw won the world's strongest man, the day after the competition, Mm-hmm. He wasn't the world's strongest man anymore. You know why? Mm-hmm. He had the trophy, but in reality, there was another man on the planet that was stronger than him. Why? Because mm-hmm. his body was broken down. Yeah, he was beat yeah. up from a week's worth of crazy competitions and he, he hasn't had time to recover, but he's mm-hmm. such a good resilient athlete that his ability to bounce back was fairly significant. Yeah, He couldn't so, have gone and won that trophy the next day. No, but give been... him a week or two. And I bet you he could go and win the trophy again. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I focus on resilience. It's the ability to bounce back. And so getting back into spiritually, mentally, and physically, that's mind, body, spirit. Again, I'm not Which making Paul up anything. says run the race, you know, right. to set your eyes on the site. Yeah, and that is reaching people and all things he gives us. Here's how I know you're ministering to me because I'm tempted to just turn over this piece of white paper and start taking notes, but I've got to host the podcast. So there you go. Hey, (laughs) this isn't a a host uh, or interview interviewee thing. This is just a couple of dudes having a conversation. But the the interesting thing about those three things is it's mind, body, spirit. I didn't come up with that. I'm repackaging, you know, age old wisdom, right? But the thing about it is, and you know this to be true, and guys that are listening Mm -hmm. to this, uh, and even gals, you're probably doing pretty good in one of those three areas right? Mm-hmm. But you're probably not crushing it in two out of three. Mm-hmm. And I know for dang sure you're not crushing it in all three, right? Mm-hmm. And because here's the thing, and people are like, well, why aren't you talking about emotional resilience? Why aren't you talking about financial resilience? Why aren't you talking about relational resilience? It's because if you are crushing it spiritually, mentally, and physically, doesn't that affect everything else? 
Mm-hmm. Won't you be a good boyfriend? Won't you be mm-hmm. a fantastic husband? Won't you be an amazing coworker or mm-hmm. business owner or entrepreneur? Like all those things kind of fall downstream <laughs> from that. But the thing about it is, is guys love to crush the one thing that they're good at. So spiritually, let's say you're yeah. just like, you love praying, you love prayer meetings, you're on your knees all the time. You're listening to Hillsong because yeah. you think it's the greatest music ever made. And, you know, and then all that's great. And you read the Bible all the time. But if I asked you to sprint to the end of the street to save your life, you wouldn't make it right. Mm. Or contrastingly, you got the gym, bro, right? The guy with traps that are like tickling his ears. You know, he's a black belt in jujitsu. He can deadlift the whole gym. He's just like, (laughs) you know, wrecked out gym, bro. Right. Yeah. But he hasn't read a book since he graduated high school. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of see what I'm saying? No. Yeah. You have these incomplete men that are like, oh, no, no, but, but, but I'm good at this. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I know I'm not in shape, but, but, but look how good my business is going. I I know uh, my business is going really well, but, but, you know, everything's an excuse. Right. And, and you this do is hit different areas because you're because yeah. I say this, there'll be guys in the gym. And again, guys, even for jujitsu, I think I told you last time, this will not be an idol for me. Yeah. Obviously, someone who does six or seven hours of skating a day, a day, I could, well, what? I could be a black belt at this age. If I die before I'm a black belt, whatever. God has used it in mighty ways. But when I go to the gym, one of the easiest ways to minister is I'll have these guys who are sheriffs, mm-hmm. members of the FBI. I mean, you have high level guys who are jujitsu guys because they're coming off the army or the Marines. And I'll right. say, hey, what belt are you in your marriage? And they'll just go uh, like, look at me and they'll be like, yeah. bro. And I'll be like, because you spend about four or five hours this week lifting those weights. And, and it's exactly what you're saying. Or yeah. we'll, and I know for me, and I'll, and I'll say this, you could speak into this. I've had times where I haven't skated in a while because I've been so busy. And yeah. I'll go somewhere to do an event and I'm going to skate for a bit. But I will just feel like spiritually and emotionally like, wow. I don't feel right about this because I haven't skated as much. I'm here not to perform because they want me now as a preacher or whatever. But if I wanted to skate, could I even do it? Or would I be out of breath doing it? Now Mm -hmm. in hindsight, you know, now, now as I am, I'll go to the gym three or four times a week. I'll roll with guys who are blue belts who are super yoked, you know, wrestlers. I can just park and wait. I'll roll four or five times. My stamina's there. My breathing's there. If you actually go back to the first podcast I think I ever did, I was so out of breath because, yeah, there was adrenaline, but I right. think I was like 235, 40. Anyway, you're saying this isn't a formula to be a Christian. It isn't like we're doing this legalistically. And you yeah. even said, I didn't come up with it. No, but God did. Mm-hmm. God did make us this way. So, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing that's the thing is people want to fight against their wiring, and I don't understand it. Um, mm. So I think I made this point. It may have been on your show or it was on yeah. somebody else's where um, it's kind of this American Western thing to make the things we suck at better. Um, and so mm-hmm. there was this, and I'm going to, I'm going to mess up the details, but the gist of the story is right. There was an American table tennis player that was like the best American, but that where table tennis is King is in Asia, right? So, yeah. you know, China, Korea, Japan, or whatever. And so the number one player in the world, let's just say he was Japanese, you know, everyone knew he's the number one player, but he, he invited this American to come <laughs> over and train with him in Japan, right? Did I tell you the story? No, Oh, no, right. it's okay. good. Yeah. yeah. So, so here's the deal. <laughs> the American goes over and just watches this number one player on the planet practice for a couple of days. And all he's doing is forehands, mm. forehand, forehand, forehand. Yeah. On the second day of watching this guy do forehands over and over and over, the American goes up to this guy, probably through an interpreter and says, Hey, everyone already knows that you have the best forehand in the world. That's why you're the most dominant player. Why are you only working on your forehand? And the guy responded and said, that's the funny thing about you Americans is you try to make the things you're bad at average, as opposed to making the things you're great at spectacular. Yeah. yeah right. And yeah. so that's kind of the same thing is like, guys, we, we love to kind of, we love to kind of focus on things that are outside of our gifting. It's like, mm. God gave you a gift, yeah. live in that gift and exploit yeah. it for his pleasure and his honor. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, that's kind of the thing people will ask me, Kyle, how can you just put four or five bullet points on a sheet of paper and flow for 45 minutes? Because God gave me the ability to do that. Like yeah, that is yeah, a yeah. skill set that was a yeah. gifting that I have cultivated over time through, mm-hmm. through schooling and through practice, but it was a natural gifting. Here's the thing. You could not have been a world-class skater yeah. if you had two left feet, if you were super pronated in how you walked, <laughs> if you didn't have natural levels of balance. Like I remember a long time ago, Conor McGregor, we talked about him a lot on the last podcast. Yeah. 
they did a balance test at like the University of uh, California or something like that, where they bring these otherworldly athletes in and they put them on this board that will shake them. Crazy, and yeah. then it will, res- it'll read how quickly they res- they respond to being taken off their base and how quickly they yeah. regain their balance. Conor McGregor at the time of this test was the second best athlete of all time. In terms of balance, the number one best athlete was a big wave surfer, right? Mm. Conor McGregor didn't work on his balance. He was given that as a gift from God. Yeah. Now he's not currently using that to honor God in any yeah. type of a direct way. But again, it, it's really guys, they, they love to fight against the way that they're wired, which some might think is contradictory to the way that I'm talking about spiritual, yeah. mental, and physical resilience. All I'm doing is describing that if you have all those areas checked off and ready to go, guess what? It's yeah. a daily grind, right? Like yeah, if you stop yeah. doing jujitsu today and 10 years later came back to the mats, sorry, brother, you're worse than a white belt, right? You remember oh, yeah. some stuff, but your body's yeah. not going to be able to respond to it. Like if you haven't hit a kickflip in 20 years, like good luck. I really hope you <laughs> nail it, but it's probably not going to work out. And you know, the reason why this is all relevant is because the way God created us, first Corinthians eleven seven says, man is the image and glory of God. So I can deal with the image, like, okay, Lord, I'm made in your image, but if I'm meant to live into his glory, it isn't a show-off thing, it isn't a flexing thing, yeah. but it is, like you're saying, maturing in all these areas. I randomly seen the other day a video of Nick Vulcic, you know, the, uh, is he Australian or New Zealand the guy who's got no limbs? And he's yeah. like, oh, you guys are talking about being tough and you're being crazy. And he said, you want to be tough? Go apologize to your mom. You want to be tough, and so that. <laughs> right. But that's a spiritual truth. Yeah. You and me as husbands, we want to go roll and we want to go do what we want to do. You've also got to walk out those truths. So, so that's been going on the podcast. You what? Two hundred episodes in. You said or something crazy. Yeah, I think I think just this week. I'm not sure when you'll release. It. I think we released episode two seventy eight or two seventy nine or something like that. But we haven't missed a week since we started this thing back in twenty seventeen. That's crazy. And so it was the Duck Dynasty guys. They came in and said, hey, well, we've got this whole massive platform. We want you to be one of the first people on it. And it's what? You said it was one of the top, within the top 10 or, or even 7%, right, of podcasts that's gone yeah. out everywhere. Yeah, the podcast has done really well and uh, caught the attention and, and kind of through some through some relationships was able to meet the the Roberts and the Duck Dynasty family folks and you know mm. they've they've got you know a lot of podcasts a lot of media stuff they do with Phil and Jace and Al and, yeah. and uh, get really the whole the whole family and so I'm the first person kind of under their banner as a non family member and so it's just you know it's a little bit of a distribution thing and again you know <laughs> uh, our show isn't the biggest show in the world, but it, it does really well. And so uh, it's just part of the growth, part of the nature, part of that next step as, as a show and as a podcast is, and I, I feel like this is going to sound really cocky to say mm. it this way, but I I, ha- I feel like you have to feel that way. I feel like Undaunted Life of Man's podcast is the greatest podcast that you've never heard of. And I'm mm-hmm. saying you collectively. Yeah. And that's how I approach it. Right. Yeah. So whether uh, my, you know, whether I get propelled into the top 10 in Spotify again, or whether, you know, this, I just consistently see my numbers come down. I'm going to work as unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm glorifying him and pointing people to the father and the things that I do. I'm not doing this to glorify me. I'm not doing it just so that I can, you know, come into Mm -hmm. my, you know, my, my studio and scream into the mic. So it makes me feel better. (laughs) The thing is, is I want to point people to the father and I also want men to be better. And I I still get messages Mm -hmm. all the time from guys that have turned their lives around and made adjustments to their life just by the stuff I'm talking about on my show. And there was, they were referring to shows that I recorded three, four years ago that they're yeah. just going back and listening to. And I'm like, brother, I don't remember what I said on Tuesday's show. So I definitely don't remember mm-hmm. episode 12. And so it's, but it's just awesome to know that that <laughs> stuff is out there that, that can be consumed for these men. Cause that's what I say all the time is like, let's say I don't make it today, right? Let's yeah, say, you yeah. know, today I get called home to glory. Yeah. Well, there's almost 300 episodes that are just going to be out there as long as there's an internet connection yeah. and it's going to have an impact on guys. But that's the whole point about making these things grow is just because you have a voice doesn't mean you need to use it. But if you feel like God has ordained your gifting with your calling, you yeah. got to step into it. And that's there's one of the big unction, reasons why we push and there's it. A, there's a compulsion. Like I feel like all my friends in England, all the people in skating, all the whatever, I feel like I'm in so many different platforms of people, like whether it's, you know, collecting figures that I'm friends with people or jujitsu or doing yeah. this or doing that. But here's the, the thing. And, and I hope our listeners understand this. Um, In our county, in Orange County, I just preached on marriage. Divorce is at 72%. Mm -hmm. So biblically, the word of God's closed. But doesn't that mean more people should start focusing on marriage? Because obviously the nation is not understanding it. So you've always got to scale. The word of God's true. And why I'm saying this, Kyle, is because 
the last two years has been a radical oppressiveness of just manhood. So yeah. the whole saying, and it was one of the comedians who said it, I forget, but he said, women are always innocent, but men in this day and age are guilty until proven innocent. When you watch TV, the dad's an idiot, he's goofy. I'm not saying get a gun and run around and be crazy. Hey, but plenty of people have guns. I have no problem having guns and weapons and all this. And I'll use guns if I have to, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is the way the world is today is radical. As a Christian, you and me with our Christian podcasts preaching, like I said, I was in the pulpit Sunday, but I have to live on the earth as a man. I have mm -hmm. to walk in the supermarket as Tracy's husband, as my kid's dad. That's a masculine thing that God has given me to do. I feel like what you're doing is bringing people back to an understanding of what a man is. Um, my son, hey, when you say something, mean it and walk it through. Protect those who are weaker than you. You know, because now you've got cultures redefining what, I mean... Picture yeah. your daughter swam her whole life and was top of it, and now culture says that person who was born male who has testicles and gets someone pregnant and puberty was different and could lay you out with probably half a punch, that's a woman. This right. is super controversial for people, but it's not at all. When I was preaching this weekend in Genesis, in the beginning, God created them male and female. It is not controversial. That is what God says. If God is in this room, they're male and female, and God is in every room. But now in this world, I'm redefining what's male and female. I know one of the big, and why I want to Kyle on is, you don't just talk about abortion or critical race theory. You go and obsess about it. You track down every article you can. You put your show out, and you have all the links. And the goal is for you to be able to tell people about, as men, loving your wife, loving your kids, defending the unborn, um, fighting back against these false claims of, you know, people are racist, I get it, but the scale that people are selling it that every group is against everyone else. And pastors, I've heard of pastors who have had the white people in their church kneel. You should shut your yeah. doors because if Jesus was in there, he would be weeping. That is sickening. So thoughts on that, though. You and I are men. We have our wives. We're called to walk into this. But there's, there is a raising of the banner again to biblical manhood because, right. and I'll say this and, let, and then let you go because we talked about this on your show even, but in Moses' generation, the males are going to be wiped out. In Jesus' generation, there was a decree to wipe the males out. Even in Kings, I love that that verse says, I'm going to wipe out the generation that pisseth on the wall. Who pisses on the wall? I'm sure a woman could do it. I've seen some pretty drunk women in, in Liverpool <clears throat> growing up, but that's men. If you wipe out a generation of men, masculinity what they stand for you change a culture and yes this this is not where we belong we are aliens here but we are meant to demonstrate the kingdom so heaven forbid you you your time was up and you went to be with the lord but those 200 episodes i'm telling you just ministering now it's making me think even more about the health side of it or yeah. for men who are sitting there saying hey i'll take my kids to walmart all day it's at mcdonald's but if you drop dead at 55 didn't finish your retirement, what can you do? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, the entire reason why I'm to life is here, our mission, which I probably should have said earlier, is equipping men to push back darkness. Okay. And so that's not equipping persons or zers or whatever random pronouns. No, it's equipping men to push back darkness. It goes mm. right back to the example you use about the church. If a gunman comes in, you want a bunch of sheepdogs running toward the sound of danger and you want the women and the children going somewhere else, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the model of protection because, you know, if you think about it just biologically, mm. a womb is infinitely more valuable than sperm is mm -hmm. right. Because mm -hmm. if you want to wipe out a people, you wipe out the women. Yeah. Because if, yeah. if you, you know, if there's 50 women, 50, 50 women and 50 men in a tribe, right? Yeah. You could kill all the men except one and leave the women alone. And that tribe's going to survive. That one guy's going to be busy, but by yeah. golly, they're, they're going to have yeah. generations to come. But if you flip it and kill every single one of the women, except for one, that people group is absolutely and completely finished. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's an onus on men that most pastors lament, but they don't, they don't feed into, they don't preach mm -hmm. into a lot of men don't understand masculinity. Uh, and a lot of modern pastors are a little bit more on the effeminate side. They're more drawn to, to ministry. They're more drawn to those types of things. They've kind of fallen into that. And mm -hmm. so the way that they deal with men is they do a once a year prayer breakfast at six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and they bring in some ex football player to come, you know, talk and, you know, talk about how he used to chase women and do drugs. And he doesn't do that anymore because Jesus. Or skateboarder. I've right. been to or, a couple of them to tell them right. off. Yeah. And that's fine. <laughs> 
And that's fine, but that's not men's ministry. That's just a program, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, That's a one-time thing. They say only 10% of churches have men's ministry. Right. Like, and, but the thing is, is like, why focus on men's ministry and nine, why not just focus on making your church man friendly? Mm-hmm. Right. There, there was a, a guy that I was connected to a pastor on the East coast here in the United States. And I asked him about his men's ministry and he just kind of laughed. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was connected with you. Cause I heard you were like the men's ministry guy. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm the man friendly church guy. Right. I don't, we don't do men's ministry. We just have a church mm. that is so man friendly that the men love coming. They love serving and they are, they are catechizing their children. They are spiritually in charge of their households. And it's mm. like, it doesn't have anything to do with our programming, but it has mm. something to do with the, the music that we <laughs> sing and the lyrics it has something to do with my sermon content it has something to do with mm. how the, the pastor holds himself. And this is a guy that's in shape and he focuses on that. Mm. I feel like I'm, I'm going kind of everywhere with your question, but, well, but you're right in line with me then. Yeah. Right. But ultimately <laughs> the, here's where we are, Brian, with culture. Anytime culture tries to redefine something, they're only successful if we allow them to. And so you tell this, uh, you know, you tell these girls that, mm. Hey, this man, that's walking around your locker room with his junk out. Mm. And, and if you complain to your coach, you're the bigot. And it's Crazy. like, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. We live in a time where truth should still be relative. We aren't, we aren't postmodern just because you say we are, because truth is still real because that person has Y chromosomes, right? Yeah. That doesn't make science. Them that person needs counseling because they have a mental health issue because they think they're a female, right? Yeah. That person needs our pity, not our celebration. Yeah. Right. But society we and help. Can, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But as society, we're trying to make our women men and we're trying to make our men women. And mm-hmm. I think even there was a famous actor, Sean Penn, he, he talked about this uh, recently. He was basically talking about we're trying to feminize our men because we're scared of their masculinity and we're calling it toxic when we can't even define what right and wrong is because our worldview doesn't align for that because mm-hmm. their worldview is in, inherently atheistic, which means they're a materialist, which means we're just highly evolved monkeys that used to be fish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like we're just stardust yeah. bumping into other stardust. Right. <laughs> None of this should actually matter. But if things are true, then they're worth fighting for. So as a society, we've given too mm. much ground to people, a lot of which on the, the secular atheist left that have just crept into our world. And we're just now seeing people pushing back, pushing back against mm-hmm. this idea of toxic masculinity across the board. There is toxic masculinity, but not the, the way that most people would de- de- describe it that work at Vox or Vice News. But mm-hmm. the, the more culture keeps pushing in, the more we need to have men that are equipped to push back, whether that's on critical race theory or the, mm. the absolute slaughter of the un- unborn or LGBTQ issues. Because the thing about it was, is Jesus was very forceful with calling out sin, but he was very tender with the heart of the sinner. And, mm-hmm. and yet we're only focusing on the tenderness. We're, for, yeah. we're focusing on the grace of Jesus and not the truth of Jesus. We're focusing on the lamb of God and we're completely ignoring the mm. line of Judah. And guess what? Whenever the temple was cleared, <laughs> that was the line of Judah. Jesus left the temple, made a whip, came back, premeditated aggression, premeditated violence and cleared out the temple, which Mm. took a long time, which was sustained aggression. And no one even thought about stopping him. I'm Mm -hmm. sorry. Let's not keep talking about Jesus as if he's this Danish guy that, you know, went around with these soft white boys carrying a lamb, carrying a lamb and kissing people on the tips of their noses. And no, he was a, he was a rough. He was radical. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I went a lot of places there (laughs) because you teed me up that way. But that's, that's really what we're here to do. We want men to be able to push back darkness the way that they do that is I do have to do all this research. I have to describe all these things because their pastors don't want to touch it. They don't mm. want to talk about race during the George Floyd riots because they don't want to be branded as a racist. It's way easier to just tell their white people, the con- congregation to kneel and apologize to black people in the church that they themselves have not oppressed because of their race. There's just a lot of things that men need to understand about these topics that they don't. So that's the gap we're trying to fill. Well, even what you're saying, it's, it's, it's a couple of things I want to say pastorally. Jesus never went after anyone, but they came to him to challenge him. And because they were wrong and their intention was to overthrow God's truth, he stood and he declared and they had a problem with it. And what I mean is when the Pharisees came, when the Sadducees came, he called them names. I'm not out calling people names, but here's the thing. Even my preaching on marriage this weekend, the Pharisees come to him. Shammai's teaching, Hillel's teaching. Shammai's teaching is you can only get divorced for adultery. Hillel, who is liberal, his teaching is if your wife bans your food, if she's loud when the TV's on, you could say, if she's uncovered, if she fights with your family. So he's hyper liberal. And so they ask Jesus for any and every reason. And then Jesus goes back and says, 
And you and I need to be saying this, I'm sure as much as you're saying it, I can hear it already. Haven't you read? Where are you getting your information from? These liberal Christians, don't hear politics people, but I mean this progressive movement in the past two decades who softened the pulpit, never used the word repentance, never used the word mm -hmm. sin, would have been fine sitting with me when I was divorced and suicidal, would have watched me blow my brains out, but said, but I loved them. No, you might have had mm -hmm. compassion. You might have sat with me on a bench. You might have gave me exactly. a hug or sent me all the new progressive books. But right. you never told me I was dead in sin. And if I do blow my brains out, I'm going to hell. My point is, Jesus takes them back to Genesis. And then they challenge him, Matthew 19, 7. And they say, why did Moses command that we give our wife a certificate? And I'd never seen this. In that verse, the teachers of the law say to Jesus, why did Moses command? And it's amazing. Moses never commanded Jesus said, Moses permitted it. Moses allowed your liberal thinking and he gets, and I'm, and I'm qualifying what you said. He said, because your hearts were hard. Moses allowed you, Kyle, to divorce your wife because your heart was hard. And that's the point. So it's angry. It's wound up by things. It's pushing back. It's emotionally driven. I'm saying this to say, Jesus stood as a man for what was true. He called out people who were going to kill that woman with rocks. Even in that sermon, I made the point, if my 21-year-old son came to me and said, Dad, my, my, my wife Cameron, she's driving me crazy, you know, she burned the food, she did this, she did that, I'd be like, son, let's go outside. Put on the gloves, we're going to get before God, we're going to spiritually pursue Him, you're going to fight for your marriage. 85% of millennials are walking out of their marriages. So what I hear from you is, pastorally, you want the men in the church to fight Cover the, I mean, right. and when we're here and fight, we don't mean throwing blows as we're getting attacked. We mean fight, press in emotionally, <laughs> physically, spiritually, wash our wives in the way, train up the kids in the way they should go, serve the community. And you're saying, yeah, the guys in the church with the khakis and that, don't all get rid of your khakis, guys. But what you mean is engage culture where they are where we've been so distant right. and stand on God's truth. Nothing I've heard about you is saying, oh, these guys, blah, 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 blah. What you're saying is it's one thing to be in the church twice a week, but yep. there's men who are out there on the construction sites, on the mats, doing whatever they're doing. So, Well, it's, yeah. it's engaged culture, hmm. but don't live downstream of it. Yeah, and that's yeah. the reason, because Brian, why is divorce, why is the divorce rate so high in the United States? Because we focus on wedding, not marriage. Mm, like yeah, that, yeah. that's number one. Yeah, we celebrate right? the wedding. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, let's let's put all this focus and money into wedding. My my wife is a very, you know, uh, accomplished wedding photographer here in Oklahoma. And you know, she's been she's done international weddings, like she's mm. she's incredible. But I've helped her at certain weddings. And I remember going to this wedding and it was, it was primo. I mean, my goodness, they spent, they probably spent $15,000 just on the food, the catering for the mm. event. The marriage didn't last a year. Ugh. So here's all this money and effort and time spent on having the exact right menu and the exact place setting and the perfect yeah. flowers and the, the best event on the best day when the most people could come. And yet these people obviously weren't focused on whether or not that they could do life together. Mm -hmm. And also as a culture, we don't care about covenants anymore, right? So mm -hmm. there have been men in my life that their marriages were falling apart and they were ready to tap out or, you know, Christian or yeah. not because the divorce rates in the church are just as bad as the divorce rates in, yeah. in culture. And I'm one of the few guys in their life saying, oh, I'm sorry, that's not an available option to you. You made mm -hmm. a covenant before a holy and just God. You're not able to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're mad at me now? Worst case scenario is you blast me in the face, brother, but I'm still putting these <laughs> chips in the center of the table because if you're not willing, you're not strong enough to lift the weight of your marriage, so I'm going to get up under the bar and help you lift it, right? Mm -hmm. And you make the Amen. decision that you make. Like, you're you're an autonomous human being. You can make your own decision, but I'm here. You have to let me get under the bar, though. You have to give mm -hmm. me permission. You have to, you know, get permission to get some other guys to help you out, get some people that can work in their life. And, and again, I'm painting with a broad brush as it pertains to marriage. I hear you. But but again, we're, we're living downstream from culture. Or, or we're trying so desperately to be like culture that we're willing to take on the things that they're saying. And yeah. I'm all for having good looking graphics at your church. I'm all yeah. for if the pastor wants to look like he bought clothes from this century. I'm all for, yeah. you know, pastors using language that is relevant to their audience. All those things. I'm fine with all of that. As long as there's auth authenticity there, but when and you're, you're number, not leaving out. Yeah. Right. But when your number one goal is to keep people coming and to not ruffle any feathers. Are you doing the work of the gospel? Because the gospel is inherently divisive and offensive. Yeah, it's just yeah. what it is. And so if your church keeps growing and you keep doing these Ted talks while sprinkling in a couple of Bible verses on top, 
that's not going to be great for wow. your flock. People in your flock are going to wake up one day and realize that they've been basically eating Christian Skittles yeah, for the yeah, last yeah. 10 years. Yeah. And they're like, where's the meat? Because, yeah. you know, it feels good. It's great. But then once I leave the parking lot, I'm hungry again. And, but, the, but that's the thing as a culture, yeah. we're allowing culture to dictate a secular atheistic culture to dictate to us how we should live and operate when we know the truth. We've yeah. got the book, right? Yeah. We've got the answers. They're yeah. sitting right here yeah. in this book. And yet we're looking to culture. We're looking to Kanye West. We're looking to Kim Kardashian. We're looking to Joe Biden. We're looking to Donald yeah. Trump. We're looking to yeah. whoever to yeah. tell us what we need to think and what morality is. When we know what morality is, we're just unwilling to walk in it. Mm. Yeah, and it's true. I mean, you look around culture. We celebrate these people, all the rest of it. And even in that verse in Matthew 19, Jesus lays down the foundation for marriage and in verse 10, the disciples say, so it's better not to marry then? Because <laughs> what he said is, you need to count the cost. What C.S. Lewis famously said is, okay, there you are at the altar and you're about to get married and there's all your family, there's your friends, there's the $15,000 of food, it was probably raw and vegan and all the rest of it, you know? <laughs> um, and there it is, and you say, I do, who are you deceiving? Am I deceiving you, Kyle, in attendance? Am I deceiving my thy dad? Am I deceiving the pastor? Am I deceiving my spouse? Am I deceiving me? And guys, what we're really saying when we put these out, I, I know the heart of where you're coming from. I don't want to have to sit in a room with you when you're broken and say, oh my gosh, did I get this far? As a man, you just mature and you get off the milk and you just fight that fight and you realize, like, for me and my wife, God didn't bring two women to Adam and say, choose. It was Eve. They were cleft together. And I made this point the other day. After salvation, marriage is radical. I don't think people get it. When I was married to my wife in heaven, God spiritually somehow put Brian and Tracy together, supernatural miracle, and the angels and everyone, they know it. When you came to faith, Kyle, it wasn't like you prayed some prayer and I'm a Christian now. I got that ESV I just seen. Okay. In heaven, the angel said, this was the day Kyle confessed and they rejoiced. It's radical. And the Bible, and you've heard me say it, Genesis begins with a marriage, Revelation ends with one, the whole story of the Bible. So really, you could summarize it and say it's about God's covenant of love, male, female. It's about family, men doing their part, their headship. Right. And so from that, that's why the abortion issues in there. That's why the renaming male and female and all the rest of it, which once you start doing that, you are going against God's plan. Right. Well, we, yeah. <laughs> as a culture, we're, we're practicing sin on a regular basis. So, and sociologically, we know this, uh, the, the generic secular wisdom is that you should live with somebody before you in mm. get engaged and before you get married, right? Yeah. Certainly before you get married, yeah. would you buy a car without test driving it, Brian? You know, you'll hear some idiot say, yeah. but the thing is, is divorce rates for people that live together before they get married are higher, which is a shocking stat to people. Wow. But it's like, the reason is because you're practicing divorce. You're yeah, practicing yeah. not being fully committed to somebody. Mm. And so when life gets tough, when you start fighting, Brian, am I saying yeah. anything that sounds yeah. familiar? Yeah. When you have a kid and you don't know how to deal with the sleepless <laughs> nights, yeah. you're already practicing not being fully committed to another human mm -hmm. being. And the thing in the reality about marriage is, is that is the closest thing that we have in our pea brains yeah. to understanding the love of Jesus mm. for us yeah. is our marriage. And we live in a culture. I keep saying, there's your word, your phrase of the day. We live in a culture. We, we drink do every though. Time you hear that. That's what's ministering to us. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. Yeah. Right. We live in this culture that tells us that marriage is not that important, hmm. right? So, so, and your happiness is important, right? Or, or this is a nefarious thing. Your hmm. kids are the most important thing. So do what's best for the kids. And guess what? You yeah. guys fighting, you're creating this disputatious home. You can't have that. How about you separate? So it'll somehow be better yeah. for the children. And you're so dumb that you believe it. Yeah, and the yeah. thing about it is, is. When your children are gone, if you've done things according to plan and they're 18 years old and they mm. never come back to live with you, which is the plan, they go <laughs> off and do their own thing and fly birdie fly. Guess who's still there? Is mm -hmm. it your wife or is it your roommate? Because mm -hmm. if you've been treating them like a roommate for the past two decades while you were caring for your children, guess what? It was a yeah. farce the entire time. You yeah. should have got rid of the marriage a long time ago if you're if you're just being pragmatic. Mm. But again, that's the reality for a lot of people is they're not focusing on exactly what God is requiring of them. And they're putting all their focus on the things that are good, but not ultimately the most important. They're mm. focusing on their kids and making sure their kids are all squared away and have the best resume leading off to college, right? Put them in. 
all the different things and make sure yeah. they're playing an instrument as well. And then they're not focusing on making sure that they still are sexually attracted to their spouse. They're not focused on to whether or not they are tender enough to handle mm. their spouse's emotions when they're having an issue, right? Yeah. They're not focusing on those things because again, we live mm. in a me centric culture and we live in a kid centric culture and a culture that doesn't value mm. marriage. Why would you expect anything different? Of course, we have a high divorce rate. Yeah, and especially, and, and for those listening, if you don't even know my story and you chimed in to hear Kyle, like, who's this funny sounding English guy? I'm from Liverpool. If you're trying yeah. to figure it out, this isn't tongues. I was married, divorced, remarried the same woman. We were together for four months and married, married for three years, divorced, totally suicidal, didn't want to live, came to faith. It's been 22 years now, my son's 21, I have two more children, but here's the thing that you're saying, because when you were referencing who, you were always talking about me, if you guys can see yeah. on YouTube, guys, when you get divorced, you move out the house, you don't always see the kids, right. you're with someone else, and here's what happens, if I'm living with someone as a roommate, now I'm married, I start meeting someone on the side, that connection with that person is not like my spouse, it's behind the scenes, and now when I bail on my spouse, I go be with that person, that relationship becomes like my spouse because now it's out in the open. So what's mm -hmm. happening is Satan is baiting God with all this greener grass and all the rest of it. And sadly, you know what's crazy, Kyle? You know this. Most of the time, a guy has just never heard. Marriage is tough. You have to fight for it. We come mm -hmm. in. I mean, okay, how much did you get beat up to become a purple belt? Like crazy. All the time. I know you're going to get beat up more because of your ribs, but exactly. we like it because it helps us persevere. In skating, you fall down, you get back up, but in marriage, you go, no, no, no. I realize I'm putting a, I'm putting a house with another woman who's got so many things happen to her, so many things happen to me from different continents. And again, I joke, I call the marriage book never fails, but I was going to call it death by marriage. Everyone always laughs. That's what Christianity is. Less of me, more of him. I right. must decrease, he must increase. So really what it means is, Kyle, you and I as men haven't gone through puberty, more hair, masculine, all the rest. We are here in a war for the souls of the world to reach them, to raise up our wives and children and to just bring the gospel to this culture. Because I do think, as we talk about revival broader, that what COVID and what this attack on manhood and all this binary, whatever you want to say, and just... The whole abortion thing, you know, you're not pro-choice, it's that you're pro-death. If you left that yeah. woman, that child's going to come out eventually. When they get hit by a car and they both die, you know, it, it's double manslaughter. So even saying the fetus, what does that word mean? A baby? Yeah, we are Latin here for baby. Men. Latin for baby. We are here as men to stand. And here's the thing, and, and Mike Winger said this. He said, I, think I love his podcast, but he literally said, what's amazing for him is this whole push of people wanting to be like women, the women they're often acting like isn't like any woman he knows. So it right. isn't like my wife who's just like cordial and hanging out. It's almost like super offensive, like toxic masculinity. So you're pissed that men are like toxic masculinity. So then you go and be toxic masculine female and it's right. almost like, what are we doing here? And the sad thing is, same as back to the sports, you are robbing these girls of winning their own trophies. Right. Um, you're actually excluding a load of people and harming people. And, I, you know, as a pastor, I get why some pastors could be like, how do I approach this if I don't know all the details? I do not envy pastors for that reason. But biblically, the gospel takes care of race, takes care of sex, takes mm -hmm. care of bitterness, hurt, obviously sin, all the rest of it. So... Yes. If you just put most things through the lens of the sin of partiality, I think that's James too. That's yeah. going to give you a lot of answers on race. That's going to give you a lot of answers on male and female. It's going to have you a lot of answers mm. on all those things. But uh, as a culture, we've made this agreement that it's okay for a man to be soft and it's okay for a woman to be hard. And so you see the celebration of the dad bod or of the beta male body or those types of things. And we're always wary of the guy that's big with tattoos. Like, you know, he, he looks like he works out. Like what's he trying to prove? Does he have a little penis or whatever, yeah. the, whatever thing that they're, they're trying to, Oh, he's overcompensating with that truck or whatever, whatever they mm -hmm. would say. And then they look at these women and I'm not all for women being in shape and I'm all for, you know, women being strong and all those things. But you have these women that, that lift, that do power lifting and, and they've got these huge shoulders and they've got these masculine looking bodies. And we're just like, 
we're supposed to celebrate that as a culture. And again, I'm not hating on women that are in shape. I love when women are in shape. Like I, just like men, I think you're called to, to, to be, to take, uh, care, of your to body. take care of your body. Absolutely. Yeah. But we're celebrating them in a masculine way. We're celebrating them for things that are inherently masculine. Male. And then we're celebrating men for things that are inherently feminine, like how sensitive they are and how in touch with their yeah. feelings that they are. And that's not to say that a real man isn't in touch with their feelings, but we've gotten this idea that a man should be passive in all situations. But I love the way Jordan Peterson put this I to was where- I going to bring you, him up. That's funny yeah, going. But whenever you, whenever he talked about how the meek will inherit the earth, um, a, a good read of the term mm. meek there is not weak. It's somebody that is completely capable of physical violence, but keeps their sword sheathed, right? <laughs> they know how to wield the sword, but they keep it sheathed. They don't just use it randomly randomly to hurt people. That's the wolf. They use it like a sheepdog. They use it when it's time to push back darkness, to push yeah. back the wolf, to protect the sheep. But again, mm. we don't celebrate that. We call Jordan Peterson a bigot for even pointing something like that out, but we live in a world that is yeah. screaming for equality, but they don't actually mean it, right? Mm. They, they want equality. They want equality of outcome. They want all these things, but they only want it for the things that they're interested in. Again, yeah. Jordan Peterson pointed this out. 99.9% .9 of bricklayers in the world are men. Should we make that even the overwhelming majority yeah. of people that are incarcerated are male. Should we even the playing field? The overwhelming majority yeah. of people getting college degrees in the humanities, about 75% of them are female. Should we even that out? Yeah. Right. And, and again, or suicide rates, right? 80% of males through yeah. the roof for men. And so it's like, do we really want an equal society? Because I don't think those things mean what you think it is, but it does. It goes into the abortion issue. It goes in uh, to mm -hmm. the critical race theory. It goes into all these different areas, but again, mm -hmm. it comes down to what is truth. And I mean, capital T truth. And again, in this postmodern culture where it's your truth and my truth, it, we're even biggest for even pointing out that there is an answer mm -hmm. to the question. And guys, when you think of King David, you know, this is a king by which other kings will be measured. The city of David, a man after God's own heart. Yes, David played music. David danced before the Lord. David did all these things. I mean, when I look at David as a man, what stands out to me? He was a warrior. You know, what is it? Saul comes in the city, he's killed his thousands. David comes mm -hmm. in, he's killed his tens of thousands. The thing about me, though, was he could defend, he could fight. He understood the emotional side. That's masculine. He's male. But when he fell into sin as well, he did repent when he was confronted. Saul yeah. didn't. That was his issue. David did. So I guess I'd say now, if you were starting again, if you were 14, 15, and this is me ministering to you, you'd say, okay, as a man who's going to marry, who's going to raise up kids, what would you say to yourself? Like, what would you be like, this is the, this is the view? You know, or for a church, if I was planning a church, okay, Brian, how do we go there? Is it focusing on those three pillars, the emotion, spiritual, fit, your strong wise, that's it? Or Yeah. I mean, if I could have a conversation with 13 year old me, you know, I would, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd make sure that when Bitcoin became a thing that I threw some cash that direction, I'd probably invest in Netflix and Amazon in the early days, you know, a couple of things I'd probably bet on some fights that I knew uh, was going to go one way or the other, but Matt Sarah focus, and GSP, you'd bet on that. Right, that's right. <laughs> uh, I, oh my gosh. I would have been able to retire off of that fight, but so focus on spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, because those were concepts that I never even thought through. Because one thing that mm. I've thought about is what if I had 10 more years of thinking about this subject, what would I be saying? Because you always want to look back on who you were about five years ago and be a yeah. little bit embarrassed that you were so stupid. And so like, I'm 35 years old and I look back at the time when I was 30 years old, I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought that. Oh my gosh, I read that. Oh my gosh, like that's, that's not how that you I, do a triangle. <laughs> right, that's something that I said out loud. What a stupid person. I remember over five years ago, there was a guy that was about this tall. I'm only about 5'10". He was about this tall, and he was on the security team at church. And I was like, who's this guy? What is he going to do? By the way, he's a three-time world no-gi champion. But I'm like, that doesn't matter. Look how small he is. Again, how stupid of a human being could I be? I'm just so glad I didn't go poke him in the chest. But but that's what I would. That's how I would converse with that person. Is mm. I've always was a little bit mature for my age. I was a goopball, and I like to get people to laugh. But I was always a little bit mature for my age. But I would have been so much more pointed in the things that I wanted to do. You know, that was the age where I was like, ah, who reads books for fun? That's so stupid. And now it's like, I'm mm. reading like eight books in the next three weeks just to be prepared for interviews. You know what I mean? I, I'm yeah, just, yeah. I'm wanting that knowledge and just the, the importance of having a real relationship with scripture yeah. uh, to let the, the scripture marinate over you. That's one thing mm. about the Robertson family, Phil Robertson being around him. That guy has never sat down and tried to memorize scripture a day in his life, but he has read the Bible so much 
that it just comes out of him. And that's that Phil, the oldest one. Yeah, yeah. Phil, the, the patriarch. That's right. You know, I just interviewed him for the podcast here recently. It'll probably be out by the time this interview is out. Yeah. He's marinated in the scriptures. Amen. He's not studying them in the way that we study things. He's not memorizing them. He's not focused on, oh, here's my memory verse for the week so I can check the box and be a good Christian. He's just marinated in mm. it. It's just pouring over him. He's not worried about social media because he's not on it. He's not worried about Netflix because he doesn't have it. He's not worried about these things. He turns off the news when he feels like it's infecting his brain and affecting his emotions, right? Mm. And so that that's the thing that I would that I would say is just try to be marinated in the gospel and to seek it out in that way because that's how the Lord's speaking to us. Mm. And what would you say then, uh, switching gears in jiu-jitsu, uh, what's your game? If someone comes to your gym and yeah. you know you're going to um, body triangle them and squeeze them, what's your game? <laughs> what are you going for? <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a, a, a we're jerking off the exit ramp here. But I, I just thought about that because I just, you know, after I got my, my purple belt, I took a few days to kind of, you know, think through everything that I'd experienced <laughs> and all those different things. Because, you know, Brian, in the first four years that I trained jujitsu, I probably lost an entire year to injuries. Uh, you know, I broke my nose, I, which I just got a mask so I could continue to roll. I destroyed every ligament in one thumb. Um, you know, I popped a rib out, you know, three, three wow. weeks before, uh, you know, the promotion night and all those different things. But my game is, uh, is really predicated on takedowns and pressure. And so uh, I don't really like the idea of fighting off my back because in a real life scenario, because again, I'm not training to be a world yeah, champion. Yeah. We have world champions at our gym. Uh, one of our best guys in our gym won IBJJF uh, brown belt last year. I mean, he's an mm. absolute killer. That's what those guys are doing. So they're working on all these interesting positions. De Hiva, Spider. Yeah, yeah, De La Hiva. And oh, they're going to Baron Bolo. And then they're going to end up taking the back and they're going to do the, you know, this thing and the dragon and blah. That's great. But for me, I want to be able to utilize jujitsu, not just in a sport context. And if I'm on my back in a street fight, I'm yeah. losing that street fight, yeah. right? Because if I go wrapping my legs around his shoulders and that guy's deadlifted before, he's going to lift me up and spike me down, you know, Rampage yeah. Jackson style. Yeah. And Ricardo so, Arona. I, yeah. right. And so I'm totally okay with if I'm going with a better guy with getting the first two points, securing the takedown, but eventually losing losing uh, the match in the gym or losing the role. I'm totally mm. fine with that. So I, I really focus on my takedowns and I don't have a big wrestling pedigree. I wrestled for a couple of years in high school, but it just, it aligns with my, you know, explosiveness, my strength and my speed. Yeah. It's just something that I'm able to do. Every tournament, I've won every tournament that I've entered. Uh, and it's been basically, I get the first two points and then I just smash from there. The things I really do need to work on are being more offensive from my back. I've gotten better at being defenses from my back. I mean, you know, you're not just cutting through my guard like it's a hot knife through butter. Yeah. And so that that's a lot of those types of things. Even recently, I've gotten gotten my head around X guard. So I'm using X guard quite a bit more. I'm doing things from lockdown, which is kind of a, a bottom half uh, yeah. half guard position, um, at least stopping people and frustrating them and then also sweeping from there. But yeah, everything that I do uh, up to so this So you're point, as calculated as you are with your podcasts and your reading. You're like, here's hey, exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, part of the thing is, is I'm honest with myself about where I suck. And so the thing about it is, is like, I have two, two, two options. If I see an area that I suck at, mm -hmm. I can either ignore it and pretend it's not happening or I can work on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I get to evaluate whether it's that important. So there are certain positions that yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Like that is not something that I want not to do with my Bolo. body. I'm the yeah, Baron yeah. Bolo is not going to be great for a guy that's had a bunch of neck injuries. Sorry. It's just not going to be a part of my game. Mm. It's great to know that position. It's great to be able to point it out and say, Hey, I recognize that. But yeah, it's just not really, it's not really yeah. a huge focus for me. Cause again, I'm not going to be the world champ. I'm going to be the guy that's just going to want to train for the remainder of his life and train and, and teach other people how to do things that are important. But I want to, yeah, as I, as I progress in jujitsu, I want to focus on those high leverage uh, positions. Yeah. I'm going to focus on those high percentage takedowns. Um, and John Donaher uh, was recently on a podcast. He was on the Lex Friedman podcast with yeah. George St. Pierre and Gordon and Ryan. Gordon Ryan. Yeah, yeah. It was an incredible podcast. So that was one of the things that Gordon or that John Donaher talked about is he talked about simple high percentage positions and simple high percentage chokes yeah. and working your entire game to that direction. And so it's like, if you can yeah. take someone's back, they're going to have a hard time defending you. So there you need to work on the body triangle. You need to work on, uh, mm. you know, keeping, retaining that position. You need to work on, I do a mainly gi, not yeah. no gi. So I'm working on controlling the collars, working on misdirection. So th those are the things that I'll be focusing on as I uh, mature into my <laughs> jujitsu journey. And who's your favorite jujitsu guy then? Is there like, so Aside funny thing about GSP, that. GSP. Yeah. yeah. I love GSP. So uh, <laughs> this is going to be very interesting to your audience. And I'll tell you why. It used to be Andre Galvao, but now it's probably Gordon Ryan. 
And those two are going to be doing the super fight. Just hold on, hold on for, you know, per, you know, uh, to stop your judgment, just hang on for one second. Um, and those they're doing the super fight at ADCC this year. You know, it, it, Gordon Ryan talks all the trash and McCusson and all that. Andre Galval came and did a seminar at my school, like the mm. fifth or sixth month I had been training. So I've got this terrible gi. It doesn't fit right. I've got my white belt. And so here we are at this three hour long passing seminar. I understood the first hour, the next two hours were a blur because I didn't even understand the starting positions. Right. Mm. But now the seminar is over and he's pulling people out of the class to come roll with him, you know, for a minute or 90 seconds. Right. So he's pulling out this purple bell and he's pulling out this and I'm the guy with my phone. Right. I'm just holding it mm -hmm. and I'm just taking video of everybody. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, they're getting to roll with one of the greatest ever. Right. And then he points at me <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm the guy with the camera. Like I can't, I can't roll, but what are you going to do? So I hand the camera off. And as I'm walking out to the middle of the mat, my hair was a little longer and all over the place. My beard was a little longer and a little puffy. And he, and he looks at me and he goes, Oh, Viking. Like you look like a Viking. So from that day forward at my gym, I've been Viking. I've been called Viking. Like he gave You're me baptized by Galvao. Yeah, You're the Viking. He, Right. You know, this, you know, six, seven time, you know, IBJJF world mm -hmm. champion gives me my jujitsu nickname. How cool is that? But you know, th this guy, uh, let's just say I, I tried to get him on the podcast, tried to do some things and he kind of flaked on me a couple of times. And I was just like, okay, I'll just log that away in the memory bank or whatever. But then seeing how easily Gordon Ryan has been able to get under Andre Galvao's skin and affect him. Mm. There's a thing that I don't know what it is about my personality, but I'm attracted to people that talk ridiculous amounts of trash and then back it up. Right. So Terrell Owens, a wide receiver back in the day, talked ridiculous <laughs> trash and then torched the defense. Conor McGregor, especially early in his career. So you like the crazy. hype. You like the hype and then the deliverance. Right. Yeah. And so a guy like Gordon Ryan, he talks crazy amounts of trash at one of the uh, fight to wins that he did. He wrote oh, on a piece of paper, how the sub, finish. how, how he's going to sub Triangle. a guy. Yeah, and he put it in an envelope and he handed it to the announcer and he said, open this after the match is over. And right there on the piece of paper is a big triangle. And I'm like, that's so cocky. I love it. I know that cockiness is not a good thing. Well, let it's me qualify it for too. everyone. Gordon Ryan is a no-gi um, white, you would say, from what? Like, um, where's he from? Like the East Coast, right? I, I know that he trained in New York for forever. Enzo I don't know exactly Gracie where Danaher, from, yeah. And he came in and he blew the sport up because he kind of went after people. And I don't think he's a believer. You know, he's very no. open outward processor. He's around some guys who are believers. I know that, though. And so he kind of take took this will by storm, but he's elevated it all. And his whole flex is a lot of these guys will do certain moves, but like not really go after a finish or something. Right. So he's in there. He's challenging them all. Um, and yeah, and he provokes them. But, he's, but here's the thing, he's super gracious. If he was getting smashed, he'd be like, I'm getting smashed. He wanted yeah. to fight them all to say, is my jiu-jitsu good enough? He rose to the top. It's kind of like, you know, a WWE story, the way he goes yeah. through it, but but he backs it up. So you, so you, you just love the hype. You love what so, it's crazy, yeah. I love that, but also John Donaher, who is his main jiu-jitsu coach, is, he's basically a cheat code. Right. So if he's your coach and you train every single day, he's going to give you the best stuff and it's going to work. And that's one thing that I've noticed is uh, I think he had been training for a total of seven years and he beat uh, this uh, jujitsu fighter named Cyborg who had been a black belt for mm -hmm. longer than Gordon Ryan had been training yeah. and Gordon Ryan submitted him in competition. And it wasn't a, a it, it was a dominant you know, a performance. It wasn't just like, Oh, he, you know, went, you know, and he and was threw slapping, a Hail Mary. he was slapping Gordon. Yeah. That was, that was, a, kind of yeah, that was yeah. a later, later match where uh, he knew cyborg knew he couldn't beat Gordon Ryan. So he just wanted to get disqualified. So he would have an excuse like, Oh, I would have beat him if I didn't get disqualified. But mm -hmm. I guess that's the thing for me is I spent the first two or three years of my jujitsu life, drilling these things that just flat out didn't work for me. Mm. Right. And it doesn't mean that they don't work ever. It means that they don't work a lot of the time. And so like, uh, for instance, and this is major nerding out for jujitsu people listening to this, and then we'll, we'll get back on the on ramp yeah. and stuff that you can absorb. If I have somebody I'm in top position, but I'm in their guard, right? I spent probably three, three and a half years trying to break their guard from my knees. Right. So I'm working all these different positions. Yeah, I'm doing back. the things. Yeah. I'm sitting back. I'm, you know, putting my, you know, all my weight in my lower back and Arms I'm pushing and my elbows, hip out. And, yeah. yeah. And I'm trying to, you know, stuff their pants into their, their rib cage. And I'm doing all these different things. And this is what Gal Val said. And this is what the guy that just won IBJJF did, blah, blah, blah. One day, one of my coaches said, Kyle, stand up. I'm stuck in this guy's guard. I'm trying to get out. Blah, blah. And then I stood up and shook the guy off of me and his mm -hmm. guard broke. 
Mm. And so from that point forward, and that's a Donaher thing. It's like, why do you can constantly drill positions mm. that are old school things that don't work anymore? If you have a yeah. guy with strong legs, you're never going to break his guard by just yeah. pushing your Roger back. Roger Gracie, you're never going to yeah. get out of order. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hodgers is just basically going to dominate you if you stay in that <laughs> position. And so that's the thing for me as well is uh, Gordon Ryan is the, the A side of the Donaher death squad. And now that they've kind of split off, he was always the A side. Yeah, And I just want to see where he can take the sport to. When I had you on my podcast, yeah. we talked about Tony Hawk. When Tony Hawk you know, retired from competition, he had elevated the sport to a certain degree. And Bucky Lassick and Bob Burnquist yeah, yeah. and Andy McDonald and all those guys, they elevated it to a level. And then when they all retired like from competition, it's like, all right, young bucks, show us how it's done. We've mm-hmm. shown you what's possible. Now take it to, to you know, the, the next, next level. level. Right now, Gordon Ryan is doing that. He's 25 years old. Crazy. He could compete for another 10 or 15 years. There's no telling what type of thing he's going to be able, like the bar he's going to set for people. For the next generation. Right. But then we got kids that from the age of three or four years old, they're wrestling and rolling, <laughs> right? I can only imagine what this, what's going to happen to the sport. Think about GSP. Like there were never people that were training MMA, right? And now yeah. kids from an early age are training Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu and boxing and yeah. wrestling and all these things. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's going to be crazy. Well, I'll tell you something you probably don't know, but um, now that you said that, Bob Burnquist is a purple belt, or he was. Really? He was two and a half years ago under uh, Gracie Baja. So wow. he knows his Jiu Jitsu. A lot of guys do. T- I, you know, I used to think there was a, well, there was a guy, Chris Cole. I think he was a blue belt in jiu-jitsu years ago, but I don't know. But again, guys, I'm purposely leaning this in because I always want to be able to just go wherever we need to go. And to me, this has just become a big part of my life. I know on your show, when I was a white belt, I got to go to Costa Rica and crazy outreaches and minister, Mm -hmm. teach part of a class. One in six kids there like abused and one in seven women or something like brutally attacked. So we did a whole thing in the city gym that was free. Right. I've seen so many people come to faith through jujitsu. As a man, it helps me stay in shape. So I love it all. And one of the things that's been amazing to me is God has connected me with these very, very famous and known jujitsu people. Right. And I get to be in these crazy conversations if it's in an airport, in a gym. And you know, it's cheesy, but I always go back to asking them, you know, what's the greatest submission ever? And mm-hmm. they'll start talking and I'll go cheesy evangelist. And I'm like, no. It's when Jesus submitted death. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> that is kind of corny, but you know, it works. It's corny, but it's true. And I, and it I, works. I point at Carlos or, you know, um, Helio, if they're in, in the room, the photos, mm-hmm. and they go, they both got defeated by death. But Jesus, he chose to be submitted by, by the grave. He defeated it. And he rose again. And normally I don't say anything else because they normally will know I'm a skater or a pastor or something. And they just yeah. know then. And when I roll, they call me, everyone calls me pastor. They come on, let's go pastor, the atheist, the agnostic, so all the rest of it. Um, And then, you know what? I want to just read this though, because, and trigger some thoughts for a moment, then we can get into whatever. But 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the apostle Paul says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. I was sharing to men one day, and that was the verse I used. Why? Because as men, you and I are saying all this stuff, and I know Today's culture, we're catching it. They're driving in a car right now. They're listening, whatever, going to work. Being on guard. I look at that biblically. Adam wasn't on guard. God told him, don't eat of this tree. God gave Eve to him for him to cover her. He wasn't on guard. He didn't know his right. weakness. He, he left, really, what he was meant to do and bailed. He fled. And then the second thing is he didn't really know his weaknesses testosterone is a great Mm -hmm. thing you will run towards the truck push your kid out the way jump off a building to rescue someone but testosterone is what leads us to anger and smashing things it's what leads us to pornography to cheating when we don't know what to do so for me just being on guard i guess i'd say what does that look like for you as a man how do you now you know you're talking about gordon ryan the things that you like to push the button how do you just as as a husband and a dad navigate yourself what do you watch for in this world and culture i guess what you'd say is that you've seen men face in the last three or four years you're like hey here's what i guard myself just practical advice for a moment yeah i think for me is the good things that i've allowed to become bad things or the good gifts of god that i've allowed to become sinful things so Mm. for instance god gave us sex yeah and he made it pleasurable so that we would do it right? Yeah. As a gift, right? <laughs> like these appendages that we have and, yeah. and the sensitivities therein, 
that's not just the you know random chance over billions of years right that, like those aren't right that, those aren't things that, that kind of end up in that direction but the same thing is true that sex can become an idol it can lead mm -hmm. to pornography it can lead to cheating it can lead to any mm. number of things domination of somebody like whatever mm. testosterone is a gift from god until it's used sinfully alcohol is a gift from God. It was given to us mm -hmm. as a social lubricant, but if you use it and abuse it, it becomes mm -hmm. a sinful thing that could kill you and others, right? And so I look at the things in me that are good, but I want to make sure that they're holy, okay? So as you might know, as you know, I forget, we're over an hour into this type of an interview mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm a pretty abrasive guy. I'm pretty brash. I'm pretty straightforward. I can easily be a sinful douche in mm -hmm. those ways, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm just speaking the truth and I'm just going to say it the way I say it. Oh man, I'm just going to describe it. You know, <laughs> you can very easily become arrogant and cocky and haughty and bull over people and destroy mm -hmm. them. And, you know, basically every personality test I've ever taken, I'm whatever animal the animal is that runs over the other animals. I'm the rhinoceros, you know, I'm the hippopotamus, like I'm that animal. Right. But my assertiveness and my ability to not care whether or not you like what I've said is a positive gift that God has given me because it's allowed me to pray for people and ask them to, to pray for them when other people would have been too scared to ask. It's mm. allowed me to share the gospel, which is something I really have to focus in on being even more bold in. It's allowed me to say the things on my show and in my writing that has done so much good for other people. And it's because I leaned into my gifting and tried to make it holy. The same mm. thing. Let's, let's say you are physically mm -hmm. gifted right? Because there are people that I train with that are just, they're Adonises, right? Yeah. If they lifted weights, they wouldn't be able to find shirts that fit. Like that's the type yeah, of, yeah. that's these guys, right? Now, if they're just utilizing those physical gifts for their own glory, it's going to be good for a while until those physical gifts go away. Think about it in a female context for the yeah. females listening to this. Some of you are blessed with incredible bodies, yeah. right? But guess what? Gravity's undefeated. Mm -hmm. And those things that are perky now won't be perky later. And those things that are shapely now are going to not look mm -hmm. as great in a bikini 20 years from now. That's mm -hmm. just reality. But if you're given a gift from God, like an athletic gift, but you don't use it to his glory, you will, whenever that gift runs out, you will wonder where, like what mm -hmm. your purpose is. Yeah. So you were gifted like Bo Jackson is, and then now you're not a professional baseball and football player anymore. Now, what are you going to do with yeah. yourself? Look yeah. at a guy like GSP. He's retired. He's the greatest MMA fighter of all time. He doesn't have a Christian worldview. He's not a Christian. What about when his body really starts to fall apart, right? When he really starts to yeah. see that his performance has gone away, what is he going to think about his purpose in life? Because his purpose in life for forever was being the greatest 170 pound yeah. fighter in the history of the planet. Or even and an now, idol to people right now, because he is a healthy, well-spoken, very sweet right? man. Yeah. Right. But that's, that's the whole thing is for a lot of men, the practical advice is God has gifted you with things that are unique to you, mm. but they're not unique to humanity. And so if he's given you a gift of gab, you need to utilize that to his glory. <laughs> if he's given you the gift of, of like looking at data and parsing it out and creating, mm. you know, like getting information from that, use that to his glory. And even if that doesn't mean go work for mm. the church and be an accountant, but it's, if you're at an accounting firm doing these incredible things, do it to his glory and share uh, with mm. people that, that you live with about him. And the last thing I'll say before, we, before you hop back in here, yeah, when we were talking about jujitsu, Think about the times that you're able to minister to people just because they've seen you roll for the last few years mm -hmm. and they know your nickname's pastor. We had uh, one of our black belts at our school. I, I love him. I'll leave his name out of this because it's his own personal business, but he and his wife were about to have their first kid. His wife's seven months pregnant and the baby dies. Okay. They lose their kid. Wow. I mean, absolutely crushing. My wife's in the yeah. third trimester right now. So that's especially emotional to, to me. And I love him like a brother, right? Pray. Wow. But it created the opportunity for me to tell him, cause this is not, this is not a Christian. He might be culturally Christian, you know, basically a Christian atheist, uh, where he acts, you know, he knows God probably exists, but he doesn't, you know, live a yeah. life that would, would assume that. And I told him, I was like, brother, you're going to have people in your life that are going to say that that's her fault, that that happened. You're going to have people in your life that are going to tell her and tell you that they did something wrong. And this is God's punishment to them. Mm -hmm. But I and I said, you need to know that God didn't mean for that to happen. The world was broken yeah. with, with original sin, and we're in a post-Genesis 3 world right now. That is a product of brokenness in this world, all yeah. right? 
lean into the father, lean into God. That is not how it's supposed to be. When I made a batch of chili and took it over to their house a couple of weeks later and just left it on their por porch, I put something similar in the card. You know, basically now's not the time yeah. to turn away from him. You turn towards him. But it's because that I do jujitsu with this man that he would look at that and read it and take it seriously. Cause I'm not just yeah. some stranger. I'm not yeah. just some bum. I'm not just some random pastor. That's like, Hey, let me pray for you. Even though I don't actually really care about you. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, again, it's just, that's, that's what we need to focus on is our gifting, making sure that we're taking mm. those opportunities, utilizing our gifting to the glory of the father. And some men could be listening and they're going, well, you know, I wasn't raised in this home. I didn't have this kind of wealth. I didn't have this background. I didn't maybe think when you were 13, 14, like you, what does it mean to be a man? Or maybe I don't have a podcast. Well, listen, none of that's what matters. Even yeah. just looking at this brief notes here, you know, Adam is someone that shifted the blame. The Bible teaches that Cain murdered his brother. Noah was a drunk. Jacob was a deceiver. Moses had anger issues. I mean, David was an adulterer and a murderer. Solomon, I mean, Solomon was a sex addict, you know, the world's biggest womanizer. So you've mm -hmm. got to look at wherever we are. And back to your point, this is what's relevant. Every episode, it makes it in. Ephesians 2.10. Where is workmanship? I look at GSP and, and he's awesome. And I, I think about all the times he talks about aliens and stuff. I'm like, man, yeah. if I could just sit with that guy and unpack Genesis 6 and go, look, ancient aliens have it wrong. Guys, someone send this to GSP, please. You know, just get the Bible in because he's made with a purpose every day. So whatever man is listening, whether it's a woman listening for her husband, whether it's some youth, whoever, every day when we wake up, and we're invincible till God takes us. The jiu-jitsu mats, if we go, that's where our workmanship's going to be. If we go to a job, if we have kids, if we have life, all of it's to be used for his glory. I'll tell you, when I was divorced and suicidal, I rarely slept. Life was crazy. I can have the craziest days now. And I go in the bedroom, I can be out like that. Because I'm really trying to live into the call. Even your conversation today, I'm like, man, okay. I'm just, it's going around my head emotionally what things can i mature in or when i talk to the kids guys you've got to have this emotional standard where we overlook other offenses at times or don't take things too seriously because everyone's going through something yeah, physically what's next and then spiritually for sure so any other thoughts though i know we didn't go too deep into the abortion thing and the rest but it's evident yeah, I, I think it would be, since we teed it up a few times, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least get into the abortion issue a little bit. Uh, yeah. The main reason is because a lot of churches, uh, the pastor will mention it, but he won't equip anybody in the church to push back against it. And mm -hmm. there's a reality here in that in the year 2020, which is last year we have stats, around 73 million babies worldwide were killed in the womb. 73 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's about 200,000 a day that were killed. In the United States, that was about 850,000. Uh, so, which is about 2,600 a day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and since Roe v. Wade in the seventies, we've killed over 60 million children in the womb here in the United States of America. We've allowed for that. And the reason why I think it's so pertinent to talk about is because you probably in June, the Supreme court of the United States will rule on the case out of Mississippi. And they have the opportunity with a six, three majority of conservative majority on the court to eradicate Roe v. Wade, which what a lot of people think would make abortion illegal in the United States, which is not true. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, essentially it will return back to the states the right to create their own abortion laws, right? Oh, wow. So right from the beginning, there's probably going to be about two dozen states that will scramble because the, they don't have laws on the books right now that would allow for that, that would significantly tamp down on the ability for people to get abortions. And culture is going to tell you that this is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Culture is going to tell you that this is controlling women. They're going to tell you this is Handmaid's Tale. They're going to tell you all these things. They're going to gaslight you. But I, I think there, there was an episode I did on my podcast. I can't remember what number, but it was towards the end of last year where I talked about engage, how to engage pro-abortion arguments because a lot of Christians completely fall apart on the issue. Mm. So even in my own Sunday school, because I've, I've taught on this, I've given uh, speeches on this, even in my own Sunday school, there was a guy that said, yeah, man, I'm completely pro-life. But then someone brought up rape and incest and they were like... Ooh, yeah, man. I don't, I don't know if we could force that woman to, to have that baby. This is a guy in my Sunday school. And so very lovingly, but very forcefully, I said, in what other context would you be okay with a child getting the death penalty for something their father did? He didn't have wow. an answer for that. Wow. Right. And the thing about it is, is most Christians have to understand is we have the capital T truth on our side. We have the moral position. So when people throw out stupid arguments like my body, my choice, or no uterus, no opinion, or, you know, what about rape and incest and all that? You have 
to have an answer. Because yeah. if you expect to push back darkness, you can't just roll over and play dead when someone says something that you've never heard of before. Yeah. And so that's one thing I've tried to do with my show. That's why I talk about abortion often is I, so when someone says this, this is what you should say. When yeah. somebody responds and challenges you in this way, stand firm. Again, don't be a jerk. Like, don't be yeah. needlessly offensive. Let your message be. Yeah, don't offensive. call them names, but establish yeah. truth, like what you're saying. Because right. when this all first came out a few years ago, you know, you have all these people that were hyper liberal who were reading every kind of book, blog, and the rest to go to bat for it, using all these terms. Most people didn't know, okay, this is the fight we're in. But the reality is, it's not your body. God placed that child within you. John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb, he was filled with mm -hmm. the Spirit. God, and, and listen, if you were doing this to puppies and kittens, Peter would be going crazy. You know what right. I mean? But it's a child made in God's image. And, and this is my point in all of this. We're changing what's male and female. We're flipping God off in so many ways in a nation. Literally, we're doing that. You know, spiritually, that's where we are. We're obviously dead in sin as a nation. You know, that's all people when they're born. But now, everything you see in the Old Testament with the sacrifice of children, you think barbaric, it is happening everywhere and not we, only that but yeah. the farming body part and listen if you have been through this if something happened to you there is no guilt and shame in christ grace right. and mercy same as the episode on marriage if you face a divorce grace and mercy god hates divorce because it harms us his children but he loves you if you're a mom sitting there a dad or something happened in your life no but what we're saying when we don't allow a person to have that child i posted about this about a week ago and a lady in our church messaged me and said, I was the result of rape, and I was adopted. Beautiful husband, beautiful family, five kids, yep. thriving. I get it. You said it earlier, though, referencing this world. It's fallen. There's things that happen. This is not God's best. We birthed all this stuff. So anyway. And guess what? If she had been aborted, right? We certainly don't know her story. We certainly wouldn't be talking about her right now. Yeah. But when you murder a child in the womb, it doesn't erase the rape. And so there's this phenomenon with women that have been convinced to abort, to murder their unborn, you know, rape babies. And what ends up happening is every year they think about, wow, they don't celebrate, but they think about the anniversary of their rape, but then they add another anniversary, the anniversary of their abortion. This is crazy. Right? This is and crazy. So they're doubling the amount of lament in their life because they're wow. adding something, right? They're adding a death. Trauma. And so, Right. That, that's what I tell people. Yeah. Trauma is the exact perfect word. And so that's how I actually start. Every time I talk about abortion, wow. you know, like in a, in a church context, I always start with statistically speaking, whether I'm talking to a room of 20 people or 200 people, I know that somebody in here has participated in an abortion. They've either had one or they've paid for one, or they've driven somebody or picked them mm. up from the facility afterwards. And I will say, Jesus died for that too. He died for those <laughs> sins as well. Amen. Okay. That's Amen. not a varsity sin, right? Now, I will say it is fundamentally different because you're destroying the Imago Dei. But at the same time, Jesus died for that. But but you've got to understand, mm. we're doing these women that have participated in abortions no favors by telling them that they're not murderers. Because if I pay someone else to kill someone else for me, I am still a murderer, right? Mm. So if you pay an abortionist four or 500 bucks to kill your baby, you have participated in that murder. You can't be sanctified and saved by the blood of Christ. That's one of the reasons, and this is very, very unpopular, why I think that abortion should be criminalized for everyone involved. The abortionist should be liable legally for that mm. baby's life. So should the woman. So should anyone else involved with that woman that, you know, took them, paid for it, whatever. Because in every other context, you mentioned it earlier with vehicular manslaughter. If you kill a pregnant woman in a car, it's, I think it's 36 states. You can be charged with two counts of vehicular yeah. manslaughter, right? Yeah. If you murdered, if you beat a pregnant woman to death in about three dozen states, you can be charged with double murder, right? But th wow. that that's just the thing again. If you with, sedated her and just took the baby out and, and said, hey, you know, while you were asleep last night, I just did this. She would be like, oh, wow. Right. You know, oh, you you wouldn't be like, oh, you just removed nothing a to do with my cells. body. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's the thing is the my body, my choice thing is the most popular. Again, the woman's body is the setting for the abortion. The abortion doesn't happen to her. The only lifeless body at the end of an abortion is the baby's, not hers. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the baby has separate blood, separate DNA, separate everything from the moment it was a one cell zygote. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, again, all of these main arguments, and I think I went through uh, about 
16 or 17 in that particular podcast. I'll link it. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll make sure that you have the link to it. But like, that's the thing is you have to be equipped. Even before we did this interview, you know, every couple of months, I read through the arguments again, just so I'd be sharp, just in case it came up. Yeah. Because you never know when you're going to run into a situation where somebody is lost in their thinking and you have the ability to set them straight. But it all mm. comes back to the Imago day. Because again, if we're just highly evolved fish or highly evolved monkeys that wear pants and yeah. talk to each other, none of this matters. You shouldn't care what another monkey survival does. Survival of the monkey. fittest. Who yeah, can, survival yeah. of the fittest. Guess what? You're a weak person because you're pregnant. If I kill both of you and take your steak, it's my steak now. Who cares? Yeah. You know, yeah. animal kingdom, right? That's Which how we're supposed no to No one would agree with that. And, no. and for those who are listening, I don't think anyone said, oh, we're pregnant. We should go do this and viewed it like going to shoot someone or kill someone. But what you're saying is here's a doctor. Here's a, here's a woman. Here's a dad. The emotional damage that's done, guys, you've just got to give this to the Lord. Because obviously I'm around a million people that have gone through this. So it's, we don't get closure in this life. I say this a lot. We get something better. We get Jesus. Every wrong I've ever done, everything I've struggled with, everything I could do. I'm not habitually living in sin. But whatever I could think of was the worst thing in my life. Christ is bigger than that. The blood that was applied, forgiveness, grace, mercy. So anyone listening like, oh, these guys just want to bash relevant pol in political topics. They're not political. It's biblical. It's not right. about politics. It's that right now the world is being heightened to highlight certain things. And God's men, God's women need right. to stand and testify. Bible says we're living epistles read by all men. We proclaim the truth and we'll be hated for Jesus' name's sake. Right. We don't go off people so that your podcast is like, right. oh, he's crazy. We're just excited because for one, we want you to know Jesus and be liberated from the sins of this world. So, right. Well, Brian, do you know what politics is? Politics is our collective attempt as society mm. to control humans. Right. That, that's yeah. what politics is. That's what government is. Mm -hmm. We're trying to order things. We're trying to create order. Yeah. But again, if you go back to the creation of the universe, the reason why we live in this Goldilocks zone where <laughs> everything is in perfect order to where life could even possibly exist yeah. is because of order, because there's an order of things. There is a law to things so that when the mm. law is broken, it becomes something worth writing about. Like mm. when somebody is resurrected three days after they died on a Roman cross, the reason why we still talk about that 2000 years later is one, because <laughs> it's true. And two, because it broke something. It broke the mold because the Amen. laws set forth in nature can't be violated unless something supernatural occurs. Amen. Right. And something supernaturally occurred <laughs> in that moment. That's why we're still talking about it. So you're saying that God so loved the whale that he sent his son so that for Brian, for Kyle, for everyone listening, Listening, whatever it is I think about a soldier one time who came to church he walked by on our church service downtown and they were all giggling and laughing going out for a night party and I think one of them said you know oh bless the Lord Jesus Christ making fun and we're just like what's up guys comes back three hours later hammered drunk sit with him in the back of the church I'm the last guy there I was preaching and he sat there and said I've shot and killed over a hundred people I can never forgive myself and I'm thinking what do I tell him? What do I tell him? And I'm like, you know what? You never can forgive yourself. And I took him down to the cross at the front of the church in this old building. And I said, you know what Jesus did on that? Your sins are not bigger than that blood. And that blood can wipe away every sin. And that's what we want everyone to hear. When you talk about Phil Roberts, when we talk about what you're doing, talk about what I'm doing, the mats, the whole goal, because we've received this free gift of eternal life, not because we're good enough. We'd be out doing even dorkier things if we weren't in Christ. I know I'd probably be dead if I lived somewhere like Texas. But any closing thoughts for you? And then I want you just to pray for us. Or anything you want to encourage us with? Or yeah, absolutely. As a closing thought, just uh, to even reinforce the message there, there are people that thought that they have outsinned the grace of God. Mm. They're convinced of it, right? They've gotten multiple abortions. They've killed people. They've 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 done horrible, horrific things, and they are judging their life based on their own criteria. The funny thing about the criteria they're using is that criteria came from somewhere. How do we know that things are right and things are wrong? How do we know that? This goes back to something an evangelist uh, or taught me. You know, we'll leave him nameless because he he uh, had some crazy crap come out about him after he died. But every oh, no. worldview has to answer origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Origin: Where did we all come from? Meaning. Why are we here? Morality, mm. what is right and what's wrong? Destiny, where do we go when we die? Mm. And the Christian message answers those in the most complete and direct way. 
Mm-hmm. When people, when that guy is saying, I killed over hundred people, God couldn't possibly save me. He's making a moral judgment on his mm-hmm. own life, but he doesn't recall why he's making a moral judgment. Cause again, if he's just a highly evolved monkey, uh, you know, a, a male yeah. or a, a female lion that chases down a baby gazelle and, and kills it two days after it's born, isn't yeah. lamenting later while they're sitting there on the rock, cleaning their bloody paws about, man, I did it again. Yeah. I killed another baby animal. God, I, yeah. man, God, can you please keep me from doing that? They're full. They're happy. They're just an animal. But we have been given something different. We're able to look mm. back on ourselves and reflect and understand that we are these sinful, horrific beings. And how horrible of a life would it be to know that we are these horrific, sinful beings and had no way to be mm. sanctified? And yet we've been given a pathway to the Father. And that's the thing you need to reckon with. So to all of you out there that are on the fence about Amen. this whole Jesus thing, or you have friends that are on the fence about this whole Jesus thing, guess what? Noah's Ark is an important thing that we need to know about the details, right? Mm. Uh, the parting of the Red Sea and the evidence there, we need to know about that. How does humanity and dinosaurs, how do you square that circle? All that's important. Is Genesis to be read literally, or is it to be read in in a certain context? All of that's important. But guess what? Mm. Jesus didn't die on a Roman cross and become resurrected three days later. None of it matters. None of these debates matter. Your life doesn't matter. None of it matters. That is the center point for our faith and the ripple effects come out from there. I'm not Mm. saying the Old Testament is not important. I'm not saying uh, modern theology isn't important, but what I am Mm. saying is if we don't have the center point of the resurrection, then we have nothing. So so for you, that's what you need to focus on figuring out whether or not you believe Mm. in it right? So Mm -hmm. take a break from preparing for your next fancy football draft. Take a break from uh, the the latest release of John Donaher, you know, videos, take a break (laughs) from whatever you're doing and get to the bottom of that question. Because guess what? If at the end of the day, if we both get to the end of our lives and Mm -hmm. we die and all this was for not Jesus isn't real, then we're just worm Mm -hmm. food, brother. Brian and I will have wasted hours and hours and hours of our time and tons of money trying to pretend like this Jesus thing was for real. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, if it's different than that, if that's actually true, then you have to dedicate your entire life to it, right? Mm. That's what we're doing with Undaunted Life. We're trying to equip men to push back darkness. There would be no need to do that if Jesus didn't die on a cross. Amen. And you know, the New Testament says, if he didn't die, then we are to be pitied most among men. If you right. dedicated your life, I mean, for you and I, we get some sense of glory or accolade or accomplishment. Go, man, we got to reach people or, you know, we got to go to church today or someone prayed for me. But when this was in Jesus's day, for 300 years, the church was being persecuted, slain, burned, and all the rest. And as what Kyle is saying, there was not just one cross, there was three. There was a thief on either side of Jesus. One of them mocked him, didn't want nothing to do with him. But the other one maybe didn't even care about Noah's Ark, couldn't care about the sea being parted. Was Daniel in the lion's den to him? I don't know what he thought, but what he did know was that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes into the world to convict it of sin. I understood my sin at 24. Kyle understood his sin. Are you hearing of God's love for you as your heavenly father? Are you hearing the conviction? I've lied. I've lusted. I need forgiveness. If you are today, that faith can be moved in you through the power of the Holy Spirit and you will come alive in the spirit. That's what being born again is. We're spiritually dead. We're like white belts who have no clue about life. We're dead and we stand on the mats and there the professor begins his work. And likewise, we come to faith. We repent. God, I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit moves and forgives us. We're redeemed and life's forever changed. So absolutely. Brian, I I just, I really appreciate the time that we spent together. I know you'll put all the the stuff in the show notes, so I won't (laughs) pour myself out right now. So people I'm sure will be able to find me, but I'd love to to close us out with a word of prayer. That's not too bold. All right. Um, Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. Lord, I just lift up uh, my brother, Brian, and I just thank you so much for his ministry. And I thank you so much for this podcast and the impact that he's had on people literally all over the globe. And Lord, I just want us to, in this time, focus on who you are because you've blessed us all so much. And I want to thank you for all those blessings, but I especially want to thank you for the blessings that we can't see, for Mm -hmm. the blessings that we don't know about right now, but will probably be revealed to us later. And Lord, to anybody that is on the cusp right now, Mm -hmm. that is thinking about you and thinking about dedicating their life to you, I would pray that you would reveal to yourself to them as clearly as possible and that they would make that dedication of their entire lives to you and to your glory. And Lord, it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for connecting, hanging out, guys. Go over. How, how do they catch up with you? What's the website? How do they get everything done? Yeah, just go to www.undaunted.life. That is where you can find everything. And our podcast is everywhere where podcasts are. So Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts. Just search for Undaunted Life, a man's podcast, or you can search Kyle Thompson. Make sure if you're going to listen, leave us a five-star review. If you're not thinking we're five stars, just move on. Just move on with your life. Don't worry about leaving a review. We'll deal with that later. And guys, if you want to go roll with Kyle, you better work on some making sure he doesn't pass your guard and you hear to pass I'm some pressure today. That's right. <laughs> Well, guys, you've been joining us on the Foolishness Podcast. Why? Because simply the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 1.18, he said, This message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who don't know God, we would say, but to us, it is the power of God on a salvation. We heard, we believed, it was all the work of God, Ephesians 2.8, and we're here today to tell you, in the midst of your victory or the chaos of your life, God so loved you, he sent Jesus. We hope you'll know him. Go over and check out what Kyle is doing. And guys, I'm excited to hear more about abortion, more about being a man. I'm sure there's things out there for you ladies as well. So love you all. God bless. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. <laughs>